Ah, Sisyphus, what weight does bear upon your soul? Through tracks of quagmire and briar, yet ever so resilient, your stalwart continuance of the journey bears fruit which sustains immortal tenacity. Uh, anyway, this is Kazuma Setao, a shut-in otaku. He is leaving his house for the first time in months to get his slimy mitts on a splendid new online game. On his way back to his goon cave, he gracefully sacrifices his own life to save a passing schoolgirl from a stray 18-wheeler, and now he gets to meet God, a blue-haired, pantless anime babe who informs him that he died an extremely, embarrassingly pathetic death. The 18-wheeler was actually a tractor, which was essentially parked. Kazuma Kazuma died of shock, thinking he was hit by a truck. The girl loses her composure as she recalls his absurd demise. She introduces herself as Aqua, a goddess who guides the dead humans into the afterlife. It's the classic isekai trope of being reincarnated as a cool hero with heavenly powers. Aqua dramatically recites a generic demon lord taking over the world story, and tells Kazu that he may bring any one thing of his choosing to this battle-hardened world. He gives it a great deal of thought. And the author covers their tracks by patching up the potential loopholes within the reincarnation process. Cusco gives the selection a thorough contemplation. By utilizing his gamer intuition, Aqua becomes bored of his indecision and begins to insult him. In a fit of rage, Kazuma conceives a devious thought. He chooses Aqua as his one thing to bring to the world. She is immediately replaced by another Japanese pop idol and forcibly abducted by aliens alongside the smug Kazuma. The Aqua replacement wishes them luck on their journey, stating that should they succeed, Kazuma will be given anything he wants as a gift from the gods. It's a real-life parallel medieval fantasy world, complete with adventurers and rampant dysentery. Aqua is not as thrilled as Kazuma, and proceeds to have a mental breakdown. She is upset about being corporeally stuck, bound to this doomed planet, destined to likely die horribly next to a spiteful nerd. Kazuma cheers her up with his gamer intuition, deducing that they they should visit an adventurer's guild. This woman buys a meat so big she gives her child brain damage. Meanwhile, the otherworldly invaders go to register at said guild, which is bustling with life. Aqua, impressed by Kazuma's capability, berates him with questions which are more like insults. The pair need money to register, but lack the funds. Their despair is permeable. Aqua instantly loses all respect for Kazuma and decides to try procuring funds her own way by declaring herself to be a goddess and asking for money from a stranger. The priest feels bad for her and donates some pocket change for the registration fee. Kazuma instantly loses all the remaining respect he had for Aqua. Aqua has also lost all the remaining respect she had for herself. Their shame is permeable. The Bresley, I mean Busley, I mean Boobly, I mean, Bubbly, Guild Clerk, informs them on how classes and specializations work and measures their aptitude for each variant. Kazuma scores high on intelligence and has way too much luck, but is average in everything else. Aqua has absolutely no luck or intelligence, but excels in everything else. Kazuma becomes an adventurer and Aqua becomes an archpriest. The entire staff get together to welcome Aqua into the guild due to her cracked stats. Kazuma reflects on his adventure's hiccups, but remains calm confident in what the future holds. A montage ensues. The two do manual labor, sleep in a stable, drink the nights away, and slink further into debt and disgrace, day after day, to the sounds of inspirational music. Kazuma laments about the challenges of this brave new world, but remains composed. Aqua requests that they attempt a kill quest, citing her goddess powers as a source of confidence. She falls into a reservoir to probably foreshadow the events of the next episode. Kazuma's hopes and dreams of life in another world have been thoroughly shattered. Aqua sleeps in on their big day of questing and awakens to Kazuma's grieving. She once more reassures Katsumo that he can count on her. They decide to go shopping for equipment and proceed with the bounty. Things are not going well. The frogs they were assigned to purge are rather large, so big in fact that they eat goats for sport. Aqua accidentally draws the attention of one such frog with her laughter and taunting. She is eaten. Kazakhstan slays Kermit off-camera, preventing Aqua's untimely digestion. She is equally thankful and smelly. Kazuma attempts to retreat, but Aqua has a sudden craving for divine retribution and chases after another Mongo frog. Her wrath is channeled into a very colored conflagration she calls God Blow. It is ineffective. 
she tries to reason with her waxy opponent. It is also ineffective. Aqua is once more consumed whole and must be rescued by Kazuma. Later that night, at the dinner table, they discuss the economics of slaying frogs. Their adventuring income is scant, so Aquifer and Kazuman decide to recruit another member. The next day, Aqua's red flag of an enlistment poster failed to yield any potential hires. Kazuma begins to brainstorm other ideas while Aqua fends off her emotions. Who could this be? A potential comrade, perhaps? This is Megumin, a little autistic wizard with a flair for the dramatic who knows how to use explosion magic. Kazuma feels like he is being mocked, but Megumin is insincere. Aqua identifies her as belonging to a race called the Crimson Demons, a people renowned for the overwhelming lethality of their magic. Megumin Bye. nearly passes out from starvation. Okay. They introduce themselves. She lies about her eye patch and is bullied for her insolence. The party sit down to have a look at Megumin's stat distribution to see what kind of whiz biz is going on behind the scenes. Megumin is an arch wizard, the highest ranking of her class, and is accepted as one of the team. Back at the frog fields, Megumind explains that her magic has a long cast time and they prepare for battle. The slippery foes converge, leading to a split effort. Aqua, still seething from the spirit of vengeance, goes to unleash her new ability, God Requiem. It is ineffective. Meanwhile, Megumin displays her prowess as a combatant by conjuring a mind melting sophisticated series of cosmic spirals, followed by a glorious eruption of flame, which instantaneously converts the pathetic amphibian from a solid into a gas. Unfortunately, such magic comes with a heavy price. The explosion attracted more frogs, and Megum is incapacitated from her sorcery. Kazuma must once more rescue his feeble comrades. Quest complete. The walk of shame is drenched with frog mucus and despair. Kazuma forbids Megumin from using explosion magic. She reveals that raw destructive power is all she knows. Her passion for explosions goes beyond reason. Aqua is inspired. Kazuma is not however, and quickly tries to abandon his newly found baggage. Megumin's desire for absolute devastation causes her to cling tighter. The two writhe around, flinging goop and causing a commotion. Kazuma is blackmailed into surrender to prevent societal backlash from the denizens of the town, who believe him to be a rogue pervert, sliming up little girls for his sick pleasure. Back at the guild, they're not exactly raking in the cash from their quest. On top of things, the other available listings are all obvious death traps. Someone else is interested in Aqua's serial killer poster. It's a mega babe in plate armor. Kazuma is flustered. The knight introduces herself as Darkness and is also flustered. She is a crusader who desperately wants to join his party. The slimy ladies from earlier caught her interest. Darkness's intense pheromones trigger Kazuma's flight or fight response. He quickly tries to escape her lascivious grasp by explaining how useless every one of his party members is. Kazuma's descriptions only make her more aroused, and there it is. Her attacks never land, and she is an unhinged masochist. The next day, Aqua wastes her skill points on party tricks. Mugumin teaches Kosovo how to acquire new abilities and attempts to to sucker him into the cult of explosion magic. She is called a little girl and rejected. Darkness returns to insist on joining their ill-fated crew. She is immediately turned away, but Kazuma's ardent refusal only increases her fervor. Darko's friend, a thief named Chris, caught wind of Kazuma's desperation and offers to teach him a new skill. In a nearby alleyway, Kazuma learns the skill, steal. He instantly uses it for nefarious purposes by complete accident, demonstrating his overflowing luck. Chris is devastated stated. Darkness is aroused. Later at the guild, his actions are made public. He unveils his new ability by accidentally depriving Megumin of her undergarments. Darkness stands up for her dignity and requests to join the party once more. She is sent into a lecherous paroxysm following a second utter rejection. Aqua and Megumin don't see any reason to deny bolstering their ranks with a sturdy crusader. Kazuma attempts to convince Darkness to abandon her determination by revealing his and Aqua's quest. To delete the Demon King. The thought of the horrors following potential capture causes Darkness to sink further into irredeemable degeneracy. Kazoo tries the same bit on Megumin. She has a similar response involving her own destructive perversion. The town is suddenly under threat from a mysterious force. All adventurers are immediately called into action. A swarm of sentient roaming cabbages approaches on the horizon. Kazuma is confused. A great battle ensues. The warriors try their best to repel the 
onslaught of vegetables. Each head is valued at a reasonable price, which allows Darkness to demonstrate her worthiness as an adventurer to Kazuma. She is horribly inaccurate, but her masochism runs so deep that her ethical alignment favors self-sacrifice. Darkness protects the injured by heroically shielding them from a deluge of aggressively galloping cabbages. She is praised for her selflessness as her armor is peeled away. Kazuma understands her true motives, however. Megumin's intrusive thoughts cause her to unleash a glorious explosion on the cluster of enemies collected by Darkness's debauchery, despite being forbidden to do so. The harvest was incredibly successful. Darkness was outstanding in her durability. Aqua fulfilled her role as a healer dutifully. Megumin discharged a fat man on the crusader in most of the cabbages, and Kazuma stole the life force out of swathes of enemies, which is pretty cool too. Darkness becomes part of the gang by popular vote. Kazuma reflects on the doomed outlook of his deranged collection of newly acquired companions. All is well that ends well, while Darkness becomes aroused at the thought of being abused as a meat shield. Kazuma learns the new skill, create water. He drinks his own pee in celebration. Darkness repaired her armor. Megumin got a new staff and gyrates in excitement. Aqua accidentally caught lettuce, which is worthless in comparison to cabbage, and Kazuma was so successful from the cabbage harvest that he obtained a small fortune. Aqua reveals that she expected a hefty reward from her efforts, and acquired a substantial debt, then makes attempts at persuading Kazuma to share his wealth, accidentally blackmailing him into accepting. The next day, Kazuma is dripped out in sword mage attire. His new look inspires the party into citing their own vices as reasons to continue questing. Darkness is interested in being slimed by frogs. There are only high-level requests remaining due to the Demon King's top general moving in near town. Their thrilling adventurer's lifestyle is once again put on hold. Despite this, Megumin must still train her sorcery. Kazuma accompanies her as they wander through the hill country to find a suitable location for demolition so as not to be scolded by the town guard. It's probably okay to use high-level explosion magic on a seemingly abandoned castle out in the middle of nowhere, and so the routine becomes daily. As Aqua hustles at the market and Darkness goes for weight training, Kazuma learns to appreciate the elegant grandeur of Magoo's craft after weeks of journeying to haphazardly engage in casual fortress obliteration. Megumin's latest work is especially impressive. Kazuma is frustrated by his capabilities, or lack thereof, and takes out his wrath on Aqua, who is also quite useless. Later, at the guild hall, they have a discussion about their development. Aqua cries crocodile tears, while Darkness requests to be verbally abused instead. Another emergency quest presents itself. The adventurers rally to the gates and find a Dulahan, leader of the Demon King's armies, seething with rage at whomever is constantly assailing his castle with explosion magic. There is only one who could be capable of such a feat. She quakes in fear, but ultimately accepts her fate. The general berates her for being a pest. Megumin dramatically introduces herself and lies about attempting to lure him to the town. The Dulahan doesn't seem like he wants to fight, but Megumin continues to prod him, calling for Aqua. She presents herself before the horseman, who decides on violence. He goes to curse Megumin for Aqua's insolence, but his spell is intercepted by darkness. In one week, she is destined to die. Darkness is instantly aroused by the pain and begins to make everyone nervous with her masochistic fantasies. She gets so worked up, in fact, that she attempts to follow the Dulahan back to his castle. Groomer is invited to duel him to save Darkness, and he trots away into the flaming portal. She goes to begrudgingly fulfill her honor-bound duty. Kazuma cheers her up by offering his assistance in the matter. Darkness tries to stop them from enacting their selfless chivalry, and Aqua anticlimatically dispels the curse plaguing their thoughts. The crowd venerates her impressive display. Kazuma's hopes and dreams of a life in another world have been thoroughly shattered once more. He grieves for the lost potential that a medieval fantasy world's journey should offer. Later at the guild, Aqua begs the party to accept a quest. Regardless of how difficult, the goddess of debt goes to find a hopefully reasonable quest. She is incapable of critical thinking and attempts to select something suicidal, however. After a brief scolding, Aqua chooses to purify a lake, explaining that being the goddess of water has its perks. Kazuma devises a strategy that will allow Aqua to easily accomplish her goal. It's a massive cage. 
Aqua soaks in a dirty lake, like a tea bag in a mug of water. Everything is going surprisingly well so far, with no monsters in sight. The girls all try to convince Kazuma that they don't need to use the restroom. I don't know why this is happening, but it is what it is. A million alligators emerge from the lake to engage in xenophobic violence. Four hours later, Aqua sporadically casts purification magic as she is tossed around like a grocery bag in the wind. She remains determined to cleanse not only the lake, but also her colossal debt. Unfortunately, the monsters are also determined. Darkness is aroused. Seven hours later, the lake is finally clean, but Aqua has become a depleted husk. She longs only to reside in her cage. Meanwhile, some guy named Mitsubishi Kyogre is having an actual fantasy adventure by slaying a dragon with his magical weapon, Graham Cracker. His harem is uncivil. He recalls his promise to the goddess who reincarnated him as a familiar voice sings dirges about slavery. His profaned goddess is locked helplessly in a cage. Aqua's mental breakdown is causing unnecessary attention from the entire town and this guy who tries to free her. Kazuma snaps Ottawa out of her fugue state and she escapes her prison back in full form. Mitsurugi is confused. Aqua is also confused. And Kazuma. The hero learns everything about Aqua's adventures and begins to admonish Kazuma. Kazuma is enraged. The homies have his back if things go south though. Mitsurugi doesn't relent in his berating as Kazuma begins to understand understand why. He was given a legendary weapon, whereas Kazuma got the goddess of death. Mitsurugi attempts to recruit Kazuma's girls, giving them the heebie-jeebies with his cringe lord density. They try to disengage when Kazuma is challenged to a duel. He accepts and goes for the instantaneous win by stealing Graham Cracker and accidentally concussing mitochondria. His harem is once more uncivil, demanding the return of his sword. Kazuma man insists that Graham is rightfully his now. The hoes are persistent. Kazuma Kazuma threatens them by wiggling his fingers perversely. Every woman within 50 meters has an urge to flee. Except for darkness. The next day, Aqua is fined for returning the damaged cage, landing her back to square one. Mitsurugi has returned with a new vengeance and is hit full force with Aqua's god blow. She then mugs him for his coin purse and orders food in delight. Mitsubishi begs Kazuma to return Graham Cracker, but is informed that Graham has already been sold. Darkness inquires about Mitsurugi calling Aqua a goddess constantly, to which Aqua responds by revealing her divinity. They doubt. There is yet another emergency, which specifically calls for Kazuma's party. It's the Dulahan, who has returned in absolute rage. And that's the end of part one of season one of Konosuba. Hi. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Like and subscribe and all that. I have a Patreon if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, thanks again. Bye.